Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, the author of uh, numerous uh, fiction and uh, nonfiction books. And I'm Molly Jo Riley, producer of the podcast, curator of the Unemployment Cookbook, and the upcoming mystery location novel, NOLA. And just want to send out another reminder, as we always do, that if you are listening to our uh, audio-only podcast, or if you're watching us on the YouTube, uh, you can find us live at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every other Tuesday. Uh, and you can join us in in the chat room and chat along with us at AaronGansky.com. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So we'd love to see you guys there. Uh, find us If you are on YouTube, uh, click that thumbs up while you're there. Click subscribe to our channel, please. That helps us out quite a bit. And don't forget to uh, tell all your writing friends about us. That uh, helps us out quite a bit. So. Oh, I feel like we've done. Have we done everything? Are we ready to just jump into the topic now? Well, no. You need to. Uh, you need to tell people where you are. Oh, I yes. You'll notice a change of scenery here. I just came from a, a parent coaches meeting for uh, for a football team, and so <laughs> I had to do that on campus. And then I just ran over to my classroom so that I would be able to make it. Uh, but one reason we're starting a couple minutes late tonight is trying to get last minute details. Uh, squared away there. So uh, this is where the magic happens. This is where I teach uh, five days a week or uh, more realistically four or three, depending on how many conferences I'm going to and things of that nature. So <laughs> things get a little bit hectic from time to time. I, so. thought you, I thought you taught there three days a week, even though you showed up five days a week. <laughs> three might actually be generous. Uh, I collect a paycheck for five days a week. Uh, at, well, that's what, that's what matters. Yeah, actual teaching, uh, that's, that remains to be seen. So, um, but learning always happens and that's the important thing. Well, I'm sporting my Ridgecrest shirt. Any idea why? Um, cause you're going to crest a Ridge sometime soon. Yeah. Yeah. Ridgecrest conference center. Isn't that where the prestigious Blue Ridge mountain Christian writers conference? Oh, that is? sounds familiar. Yeah, I'll be afflicting the saints there, and I think uh, two of you were you two were the saints mm -hmm. uh, that I'll be afflicting. Uh, you'll probably be hiding out in some other class and keynoting. So I got my keynote done. I got my class stuff done. Yay! Um, got, got all of that. Uh, so now I, I actually, have to make it through the flight. Sure. I, I, that's always <laughs> that's always the big question mark. Uh, I'm not teaching this year. I'll be attending, but I'm just going to be a conferee. I'm not actually going to be on staff this year, which means I should have some time available to not attend your classes, Pop. So hmm. um, if I'm not there, you can absolutely take it uh, personally. And, uh, you know, then maybe we can get some family therapy or something like that afterward. Uh, <laughs> some, I'm, some I'm just looking forward to my two and a half hour layover in Dallas where I can go to Papa Do's and eat some more fried alligator. Mm, mm. Mm. You, could, you could deep fry anything and it would be good, you know? <laughs> Dallas, Dallas is a good place to lay over. They have some really good restaurants in that uh, airport. Well, apparently, Aaron, you have a little story about a layover in Dallas, don't you? Oh, man. You I had kind a, of, he's, he's, he's not a Dallas fan. Well, I had a two-hour layover in Dallas that became a seven-hour layover in Dallas in 15 minute increments. So <laughs> I didn't get to try any of the restaurants because I was always about to board the plane for no. seven hours. I was about to board the plane. So, ah, oh, good times, good memories. So hopefully it'll go more smoothly this time around, but, uh, we are trying to jump into our topic, uh, quickly. So, uh, we are continuing our series on gross anatomy of a novel. Last week we looked at character. This week we look at the dramatic question, which can you kind of a little bit of conflict, but it's a little more specific than that. Um, Pops, you really you handled the show notes on this one. You want to kind of give us an overview of this here? Uh, certainly. Um, like you said, we're doing the uh, gross anatomy, so we're looking at uh, in detail at some of the things uh, for the the novel, really for fiction in general, but. Uh, also for the novel. Um, and uh, so probably the as we deal with this thing called uh, dramatic question, uh, usually listed in the singular, but uh, there's often more than one dramatic question, uh, we need to uh, kind of define what that is. So, uh, And you can do this with any book. You can find the dramatic questions in any book. Before we get to that, though, let's make sure we lay the right foundation and talk about plot. Now, I know most of the people in the uh, uh, chat room with us and uh, many other people who watch this 
uh, program already know what plot is, but I always like to assume we have uh, somebody who's new to writing. So I'll cover a couple of things because it bears on what the dramatic question is. It, uh, the dramatic question is not the plot. It's something else. So I'll tell you about that in just a second. So plot is a series of events in a novel or short story, uh, and it drives the story from its inception to its conclusion. Uh, it's usually done in three acts. You don't have to always work in three acts. Uh, you can't go wrong with three acts, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be three acts. I've done a couple of books in four acts, and uh, I did one in two acts. Um, but that's kind of rare. I find three acts works the best. So a plot is usually laid out structurally in three acts, and the first 25% is act one, 50% uh, is act two, the last 25% is act three. Uh, but I always got to give this disclaimer, don't get hung up on that. If you're, if you're act one uh, is 28%, uh, nobody cares, mm -hmm. all right? And mm -hmm. you know, if you're, uh, your act three is 20%, no one, no one cares. These are just rough estimates. You could basically have, you know, a quarter of your story in act one, and you're gonna divide act two into two parts anyway, but uh, you're gonna get 50% in the middle and 25% at the end, give or take, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that's basically how it works in most situations. Uh, usually it increases in tension. Normally when they, uh, we outline these things when we're teaching, we will show a horizontal line, timeline for a plot. Uh, I've stopped doing that. I, I show it as an incline uh, or a staircase because uh, it increases in tension uh, and it ends in a climax of some sort at the end of the story. It includes plot points, which is a little different than what we're talking about in dramatic question. Uh, this is why I'm going over this is so we make sure we have all our terms correct. Plot point. Uh, there are events in a story that heighten the story and move it in a different direction for the protagonist. I always think of a, uh, a plot point as being something that happens that it's a doorway and the protagonist walks through it and the door slams shut behind him. And there's no doorknob on that side. Hmm. So the protagonist is stuck going forward uh, in, uh, in the process, whatever that might be. And again, you know, we could maybe have to uh, go over this again sometime, but you get the idea that it is something that elevates and uh, pushes the story forward for the protagonist. Uh, so normally you have one at each uh, act break. So between act one and act two, you have one. Uh, and between act two and act three, you have one. But it's become very common to put one in the middle of act two, and it's just called the mid-scene bump. It's just because it's a very long act. So sometimes you need to kick it up a notch. And uh, so it, while it may not really change the direction, uh, it is still something exciting that happens about the midway point in there. And again, so, if you insert it at 48%, nobody cares. <laughs> uh, just around the middle. I, I did want to mention that uh, in an earlier podcast, we covered the the three-act structure in a lot more detail. Um, right. And so if you're, you're looking through our archives, you can find that if you want some more information on that. I'm just going to pose a question to, just to be a booger right now, Pops, a uh, jerk. Shocking. Um, Shocking. I know, I know. Uh, we're talking about the three act structure. Now we're going to get a bump, uh, a midpoint bump in Act Two. How how is that not then a four act structure? Well, because a, a plot point basically changes the action one way or the other. Uh, it it provides additional motivation for the protagonist. Uh, something more dangerous comes along. The stakes are higher. Something happens where the protagonist has to make some decision to continue forward to do the brave thing whatever that might be. And again, this works in every genre. Uh, so brave is going to be relative to the genre, uh, but it's not really a four act because uh, the mid uh, point bump is just a heightening of uh, the intensity. It is not necessarily a change in the direction that the protagonist is already going. Okay. So it feels kind of like what you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly is um, plot points at the end of each act kind of, maybe it's a new conflict um, that, or a, a, a significant change in the current conflict that kind of propels the story forward in, in a new direction, whereas the bump is just an escalation of a primary conflict? Yeah, something like that. The old man in the sea, you have the initial problem. He's not catching fish. He's going to lose his protege, and he's going to be all alone, and he's old, and everybody thinks he's useless. Uh, so he decides to fight back. And act one is him going out to go fishing by himself. Uh, the plot point is he catches 
a fish too big for him to handle. These are hand lines, and uh, he catches a, a marlin. And so, but he's not going to give up. It's the only fish he's caught in a long time. So, Act Two is this enormous battle between him and the elements. Uh, and so he catches the fish. Uh, if you've seen the movie with Spencer Tracy, great, great movie. Mm -hmm. um, part of the mid act bump in act two, I think might be the arrival of the sharks who eat the fish that he fought so hard to catch. And then he's got to make it back to land. Uh, but he feels the failure. Uh, but then the, you know, and through act three, we find out that what really happens uh, is people hold him up as a hero because he still has the skeleton, what's left of the fish. Um, and they know he caught it and he caught it by himself. And all of a sudden he's a hero. Hmm. Okay. This, so this is Hemingway's, you know, uh, idea of, uh, of, of bravery and, um, you know, dealing with nature and the, and the problems. So that would really be the difference. If, if you're out on the boat um, and your struggle is to land this fish and tie it to the side of your boat, uh, you get this midpoint bump where the sharks come and eat it, but it's still basically the same thing. He's still fighting nature. All right. That makes sense. Um, so we've got a good idea of plot now in the three act structure. Um, and again, some of the things that we can do to, to manipulate that, uh, where does the dramatic question really come in? All right. So the dramatic question, uh, is, uh, is, is a little different. And where often we think about the action in the book, the dramatic question, I think deals more with the emotion, uh, more with character development. Um, and so that's really what uh, we're dealing with here. What, what happened is uh, Albert Zuckerman wrote a book. Uh, it's a great book, uh, Writing the Blockbuster Novel, came out in 1994. And uh, he was a, a novelist who went on to do some other things, and then he became an agent. Uh, so he's a novelist who became an agent, and he became a, quite a famous agent, started a writer's house. He's no longer the head of Writer's House, and I think that's really just because he retired to to do other things, um, you know, because most of his career was some time ago. Um, so uh, in, in my mind, as we deal with these things, what we're really dealing with is a series of questions, and that's really every story can come down to some questions. So Zuckerman uh, calls the question part that I'm about to talk, to, talk about is high concept. Then I'm gonna we'll segue into what the dramatic question is because then we'll better understand it. Uh, almost we always start our stories with a what if question. Okay, what if this happened? So it's the most powerful question in the literary universe. What if every book, every short story uh, can be reduced down to the what if question? Uh, so that's usually the first question that you get. So let's let's take Jurassic Park for example. Uh, and one uh, what if question usually leads to other what if questions. It's not just one question; it's a series of them. We call it the chain of questions. The what if question in uh, Jurassic Park: What if somebody cloned dinosaurs? In the, I guess it would have been the 20th century when he wrote that. Um, but we would say now the 21st century: What if somebody cloned dinosaurs? What would that look like? Well, that's a pretty good what if question. It sounds exciting, but that leads to another what if question. What if he wanted to make it a commercial enterprise and bring people in to see the dinosaurs? Now we're seeing an elevation of danger in places uh, where things can go wrong. Then that leads to another what if question. What if he wanted to make it an amusement park where people could interact and be carried around to all these different places and see these dinosaurs? And then it elevates again. What if something goes wrong and some people on the island end up getting eaten? Hmm. Ever a good thing to go to a uh, an amusement park and be eaten by something. Um, just a real downer on the vacation. I would want my money back. Yeah. <laughs> Might be hard to collect, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, which leads to another what if question that is what if sabotage is involved? So what we have now is a series of events, but there's got to be more to it than that. Uh, uh, there, there's got to be some more stuff. And that's where the dramatic uh, question comes in. I think you had a couple things to add to this. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to point out that, like you say, the what if the what if question, the initial what if question is is, is central. Uh, it's paramount. And that's where everything else comes from. But once you get that first question, uh, a lot of those questions are going to come more naturally, those follow up questions. And this is really where the conflict 
comes in is the a lot of times the conflict will arise from these dramatic questions. For example, um, we're going to clone dinosaurs and have them running around in, in modern day. Uh, seems like somebody's going to get eaten. Um, that's that's the natural uh, progression of that what if idea. What if somebody cloned dinosaurs? Well, then somebody would get eaten. That's what that's what would happen. So it's a natural progression. So then the, you have to ask those follow up questions. How and why? Well, okay. Well, if there's dinosaurs, how did they get here? Well. You know, maybe they were cloned. Um, these these type of, of mining questions, you're going into the mine and you keep going deeper and deeper. Um, it leads to other ideas that make the novel a lot more rounded, a lot more well-rounded, if you will. If we have dinosaurs and we're making a theme park, uh, it, it makes sense that maybe there's some uh, industrial sabotage involved. Uh, there's going to be, with a technology like this, there's going to be some sort of um, industry or commercial uh, um tension and, and conflict that comes along with it. So you start with the central idea, like you say, what would Zuckerman calls that high concept, but then you keep mining for those questions. Uh, and, and what you'll find, I think, is that a lot of times in plumbing the depths of these questions, you're going to find a theme. Now, I want to make it clear, and this is something that Stephen King says, I'm not the first one to say it, that, that you don't want to start with a theme. Um, if you start off ta wanting to write a novel about the evils of drunk driving, um, you're, what you're going to have is a, a speech or you know some sort of mm -hmm. article or essay. You're not, probably not going to have a work of fiction. Um, instead, when we talk about theme, and as an English teacher, um, I, I'm a firm believer in this, uh, that novels should announce their themes of their own volition if that makes sense. So in, in Jurassic Park, uh, Jurassic Park makes, makes plenty of statements about life. Life will find a way. Um, it makes statements about greed. It raises ethical and moral questions about cloning. Um, but these are the natural thematic questions that arrive from the subject matter, from the story. The story announces those themes. Uh, I don't think Crichton sat down and said, I would like to write a novel about life finding a way and also that people are greedy. Uh, it mm -hmm. just gets to be too much. Instead, it comes from that initial what if question. And as you plumb the depths of, of more follow up questions, um, what you might find is that some of these themes start to announce themselves. And I think especially toward the latter point, toward the end of the book, when you're finishing that first draft, you should have a pretty good idea of what themes, if any, are really announcing themselves that you want to polish up and highlight. And then that's what the second draft is for, is to go through and put some some polish on that. So I'll, I'll do one other quick example of how this works in my writing, and I'll, you know, let somebody else have a chance to talk. But uh, my my book, The Bargain, I think, is a really good example of this in the aspect that I began with a central theme in mind. Um, and when I got through the first draft, I realized that the the story was trying to serve the theme rather than the theme serving the story. And it was backward. And I had a lot of trouble selling the book. I couldn't get anybody to publish it. Uh, when I went back through and just tried to pull back a little bit and look at that essential question, what would a man do to save his wife? Um, what links would he go to to save a wife who's dying of cancer? How much faith would a man put in God who's never believed in God his entire life if he thought that it might save his wife? So when I focused more on that and the characters and what each character was facing uh, and their essential what if questions, the story started to come to life a lot more. And then the themes came more naturally uh, from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I think another way to think of it is um, if you're, there's going to be a theme or an issue, it will arise from the story organically. Uh, if you start with that, then you're really you know, trying to convert nonfiction into fiction um, and uh, not just use fiction techniques in nonfiction. I'm just uh, I think we, we lost an author today who died in 80 something. Um, Oh, for life, I can't think of who it is. Uh, wrote the right stuff, Wolf, uh, Thomas Wolf. Uh, it, but he pioneered uh, uh, called the new nonfiction or the the new journalism, or used fictional work, not fictional work, fi fictional technique to tell nonfiction stories. Um, and then he later went on to write a novel. Yeah, but it does come up or organically out of it. 
So it's okay to have several themes floating around, but as you write, your characters will start doing things that will let you know what the theme is. And that's your subconscious coming through. Hmm. Absolutely. So we've got these dramatic questions, as Zuckerman says. Um, what what was the, what was this book again? Can you you remind us? Yeah, it's a writing the blockbuster novel. Uh, the purpose of the book was to take ordinary novelists like me and uh, teach me how to write the blockbuster novel. Didn't work, <laughs> such is life. Um, but nonetheless, it's an excellent book, uh, and you know he has. Uh, edited and guided uh, some very famous authors. Um, Stephen Hawking, for one, was one of his clients. Uh, 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 Follett, uh, the guy that writes the spy novels. Yeah, yeah Ken Follett. Yeah. He uh, was one of his, cause, so he's, you know, he he traveled in the, uh, in the high cotton, as my mom uh, would say. So um, he's teaching us all of these things, and it's a solidly written book. There's some good theory in it, some real good practice, uh, some good examples. And he creates this thing called the dramatic question, uh, which is, again, different than the plot. It's part of the plot. It's what comes out of the plot. And again, he wrote it in the 1994 book, uh, Writing the Blockbuster Novel. Uh, and it, it kind of works this way. Once you have your solid high-stakes proposition, uh, your big what-if question, then you can move on to dramatic questions. And Zuckerman calls these the spine of the story. Mm. But you can do this with any uh, any book, really. You can uh, start going through and you'll start seeing things popping up uh, in the characters. And this becomes the spine of the story. I think of it really as the moral, emotional, uh, non-physical action part of the story. It's the part that uh, the reader will connect with. It's the part that makes the reader want to root for the protagonists uh, and root for some of the characters that are in there. So these are the spine of the story. So the dramatic question serves as the frame, he says, as the frame for the plot. So you have your plot, but you got to put it into something uh, to make it more than just a series of events. So again, I think of them as the heart of the plot. And uh, the answers to the questions reveal why the reader's going to bother to care or stick with you in it. So what Zuckerman does is he uses, as an example, Gone with the Wind. Uh, the book, and of course, it applies to the movie too. He uses Gone with the Wind as his illustration, and he finds three dramatic questions in Gone with the Wind. There's probably more, but he lists what strike him as the three big ones. And they're very simple questions. Uh, it's, it's really not rocket science. The question is, will Scarlett get Ashley to return her love? That's one question, because that's what uh, concerns the protagonist through much of the, the book. Mm hmm uh, second question is, will she realize that Rhett is the right man for her, not Ashley? Uh, so that's the next one. Again, notice it's not all action. It's just, you know, what, what's going on with her? How is she going to change? Will Rhett finally win her love? So here's another character that we want to know about. And that's it for Gone with the Wind. Just three questions. Is, is Scarlett going to get the man she loves? She thinks she loves. Is she going to miss the one that she really should love? Um, and will Rhett... Uh, you know, come to her aid and, and fall in love with her. Uh, those are just emotional questions that sort of give the flavor to the plot, keeps us interested, ties us into it. So let's try it with Jurassic Park since we brought up Jurassic Park. And as I was preparing the notes, I was thinking about that. Well, Ian Malcolm played on the in the movie wonderfully by Oh man! Uh, yeah. I know him, but uh, yeah, yeah. Jeff, uh, Jeff Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in and uh, he does a uh, uh, an incredible job. <laughs> oh gosh! Yeah. yeah, Jeff Goldblum. You know, uh, Aaron, I'm going to just interject right here. Complete side note, but you do really well imitating actors who stutter. Yeah, it's a gift <laughs> or a curse, depending yeah. if you're doing it or hearing it. Um, just remember, he was the one you had to raise, and I'm the one you brought into the family by choice. What does that say about my decision making? That Moving you're on. smart. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Malcolm is a, a chaos theorist. Uh, for those who may not have seen Jurassic Park six times like I did or read the book a couple of times, um, he's a chaos theorist, meaning he believes that sooner or later everything, everything you do will affect everything else. So will Ian Malcolm's prophecy about nature always winning out, nature always finding a way to succeed, will that come to pass? 
and yeah, it does in a horrible, bloody way. Oh, it gosh. comes to pass. Now you realize in that story and in the movie, Ian Malcolm's character is primarily the moralist in it. His job is to bring up in his conversation and his griping and his whining the moral to the story. The uh, protagonist, Alan Grant, his job is to try to save everybody. Will Alan Grant's knowledge of dinosaur behavior allow him to save himself and others, including two children? Interesting side note, show you how things go on in writing. Uh, the children in the movie, uh, the ages are reversed than from the book. There are a lot of changes made. Uh, Michael Crichton, Dr. Michael Crichton, the late Dr. Michael Crichton, um, received, I think it was half a million dollars to write the screenplay for it. He also directed some movies. Uh, find a, in fact, I just watched one, The Great Train Robbery. Uh, with, with Sean Connery. Uh, mm. uh, anyway, I'm, I'm getting to the side, but sometimes it's nice to know the little things that go on behind that. And then another guy comes in and rewrites Michael Crichton, and then somebody comes in and rewrites them both. And so they made a lot of changes. So if you watch the movie, then read the book, you'll see the children. Their ages are backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, the girl's the oldest, the boy's the youngest in the movie. It's the other way around in the book. I think I have that right. Uh, all right, so another question, dramatic question. Will uh, John Hammond, the guy who's putting all this together, uh, see the errors of his ways? Because uh, he's very reluctant to see that. Nothing can go wrong. He's thought of everything. Keep saying that. We have thought of everything. Well, no, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't think somebody would turn all the power off on you. Um, there's a number of smaller questions in the protagonist character's arc, but you get the idea. And that is the emotional structure that supports all the action that's in the plot line. That's why I wanted to build up this whole plot thing. All right. What do you say? Shall we talk about how to put it to use? I yes, so, please. Yeah. Okay. Let's get a little more practical here. Uh, first, you need to have a solid what if question for your book. Uh, those are usually pretty easy. I have more what if questions than I have time to write them. Uh, but you should have a solid one, one you uh, that you feel compelled to write. That's the one that haunts you at night, wakes you up in the wee hours, gets you thinking about the thing. Once you have that, uh, you make a list of key players. That's the second thing you do. Who are going to be your key players? You don't have to list every character because some will come out of the woodwork, but they're key players. And you're going uh, to have a protagonist, probably a supporting protagonist. Um, you need that. You're going to have an antagonist of some sort involved. Um, and you're going to have a crisis, a problem for them to face. And that's where these things come up, where all the emotional response comes. And so these are the things. So this is how you begin to put it into use. Yeah, and and, and these are intricately re involved, the what-if question and the, the key players. Um, oftentimes, your key players are going to come from your dramatic question, your what-if question. Uh, it makes sense if you're going to be writing about dinosaurs being cloned in modern day that you should probably have a dinosaur expert somewhere around um the but you don't it doesn't necessarily mean that you need a chaos vision uh so sometimes you can have people uh that come in that are tangentially related uh and i think that that's where you can find a lot of power a lot of um putting characters in over their head, who are in over their head, can be another way to increase that tension and that conflict. So if we're kind of continuing on with this, this Jurassic Park example, you think about uh, a park with dinosaurs, you're going to have to have somebody who runs it. Uh, if they're running it, they've got to have some money and they've got to have a reason they have all that money. Um, you're going to need some sort of like we say like a, a dinosaur expert uh you're probably going to want you know maybe lawyers if you want to involve that uh there's going to be some cutting edge technology so you're probably going to have some sort of greedy assistant uh, as well as some sort of uh, tech expert uh those types of things um you can have a little bit of fun with it in the sense that you can have characters who are not necessarily experts in the field um being called up if you will i'm thinking of jurassic park here where the um the girl in the movie, the movie is what's coming to mind right now, uh, is using the Unix system and, and trying to figure everything else as everything's 
you know, powering on. She's the the tech person who's going to sit down because the other tech person is a, a little bit inside the belly of a, a dinosaur. <laughs> a little uh, bit. Just a little bit. So uh, Filling up change of address cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please forward my mail to Raptor number four. Um, so in in doing that, you're increasing the conflict and you're also including a more uh, uh, empathetic type of a character. And so some of these dramatic questions um, that revolve around the character, as you pointed out, Pops, is Alan Grant going to be able to do this? Is Ian Malcolm going to be able to do this? Is Rhett going to be able to do that? Is, is um, Scarlett going to realize that? These kind of character-centric questions are going to start to announce themselves. Um, and, and you can do that in a, a variety of ways. Um, I'm a big proponent of the characters that are in over their heads because it's super easy to write about the, the military captain who's in charge of the ship. Um, but Pops, you've got a great book where uh, there are kids on a ship and the captain isn't around. And so the kids have to kind of step up. Um, the passenger on the bus who all of a sudden has to take over for the driver who's been shot and needs to keep driving it at 50 miles an hour so the bomb doesn't explode. Um, those types of things. So it's it's pretty easy to come up with the expected characters um, and you'll still need those in your story. Uh, but don't forget to pay attention to the auxiliary characters who really want to come up and um, I don't want to say steal the show, but they want to announce themselves and and have... Uh, a more significant role in the story. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, especially since um, we're making good time here because I want to add a, a couple of things. One is you want those auxiliary characters to come up because they may surprise you. In my book, Enoch, I had a minor character and he was supposed to come in, appear once, uh, and then uh, be out of the story. But because I was being logical and trying to follow things through and getting all the action done, I had to bring him back, do another scene with him. That led to another scene Finally, after a while, it occurred to me uh, that he's the protagonist. I had been wrong. Hmm. The first 25% of the book, I had the wrong protagonist. Hmm. Had multiple protagonists, but this guy uh, kept coming back for a reason because it was really his story. Uh, and that really surprised me. And once I got that, because I did what you were talking about, let him come up and have some, uh, you know, some sunlight to see that once I did that, the story fell together. It would not fall together before. Hmm. That's the important thing to understand about the creative mind is you have to give it some space. You yes. have to give it some space. Even if you're an outliner, once you get your outline down, you need to go back and challenge your outline. I agree. Put it away for a while, then come back and look at it and say, no, you know, is this really strong enough here? And why does this character keep popping up to me? Why does it, I can't get this uh, guy or this gal out of my mind? Why? And maybe because they need a more important role. That's part of the creative process mm. is um, allowing that, that stuff to stew, let it simmer for a bit, um, and then uh, some new things will, will come to you. So, yeah, I always want to keep it open. And I'm going to go ahead and share another little uh, Jurassic Park story now that I think about it. If you read the book and or if you watch the movie uh, and you're scientifically minded, you may notice a big omission. What Michael Crichton does is he talked to lots of people. He did all his research. He was very research oriented. Um, you know, you go to Harvard and get a medical degree, you kind of tend up being that way mm -hmm. um, with it. So he, you know, and he was famous enough to be able to get people to talk to him. So he's doing all of that. And he figured out what does it take to uh, clone a dinosaur? Well, we got to get some DNA. Well, they decided to get the DNA out of a mosquito that was caught in amber. They could reproduce that, but some of that DNA is going to be uh, fractured and not useful. And so what are we going to do now? We're going to use amphibian DNA. We're going to mix them, and that should fill in the holes. Uh, and then we can get the DNA to replicate. And then there came a point in his thinking, he goes, well, all of this is going to have to go into an egg. We can make synthetic eggs. But then there came this thing, how do you get all this DNA into a synthetic egg and get it to begin to reproduce inside. And no one could come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. No one. Every biologist he spoke to, every zoologist, every paleontologist, they couldn't figure it out. So I was listening to him speak one time, and he said, so I did what every good writer would do. You skipped over I it? I skipped it. Oh, I was right. 
So you'll see that in the movie. They go from all this talk. In fact, they have a little video mm -hmm. that they show a little cartoon. So all the viewers will know what's going on. But they skipped that portion. And the reason is no one knows how to do it. So they just skipped it. They did it in the book, too. So occasionally you have to skip something. I like the behind the scenes stuff. What can I say? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you were talking about characters, though, as well, and, and having a set of emotions. I was. Um, we have to remember that our characters have a set of emotions. That's part of the plot. We, we need that. We need to let those out. Some of us, especially some of us men, are emotional cripples, and it becomes a little more difficult. Oddly enough, um, I'm more emotional in my writing. Um, that's opened some doors for me that I keep slamming shut. This is a completely different podcast topic. Yeah, it is. But I'm just, I'm just telling you, those emotions are there because that's what your readers will connect to. Because no matter how different we are, we all share emotions. We all know what it means to be angry and sad and to be rejected and to have love and all of those things. We know what that is. And so when those kinds of things come out, it brings the reader into the story. And that's why they'll cry at a sad ending. Um, as my wife did one time reading, proofreading one of my books, she got partway through it. She turned to me and said, you better not have killed. And then no. she named one of the characters. She was unhappy. Turns out I didn't <laughs> after I rewrote it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't kill them all. But I, my job was to make the reader worry. I want him to be frightened for my character. And boy, if you can do that, you'll get readers and keep readers. They love that. They need to experience all of those emotions. And it's because the mind cannot distinguish between reality and imagination. That's why we jump in scary movies. Hmm. So remember that your characters have a set of emotions. Uh, and part of the plot is needs to deal with those internal conflicts that go on. And part of that is the dramatic questions that you're asking. Will this person do this? How will this affect them? Will they overcome this? Will they change because of this? Uh, will they give up? These are some of the dramatic questions that you have to deal with, which really go beyond just the plot. It's what's going on in the character, not just the action. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking, you know, you start with the overarching what if question. That's the high concept. Um, but as you really drill down deeper and, and create your cast of characters, um, a lot of the really relevant, uh, really resonant, dramatic questions are all from the character's perspective. Um, the internal conflicts that accompany the external conflicts, how the uh, conflict is going to change the character in some way, or will it change them in some way? And so you start with the, the high concept of the, for lack of a better term, novel idea. <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah, probably where it comes from though. Uh, you start with that idea and then, um, then you have to make it human. Then you have to make that that human. Dinosaurs uh, being cloned is not a human story until you add the humanity aspect to it. Um, the desire to live, the innate desire to live, um, the uh, the issue of greed on the part of uh, some of the you know high high uh, I can't, espionage, the industrial espionage and commercial espionage, that kind of stuff. Um, when you start talking about uh, love um, and those types of things, then you're starting to put more of a human spin on a, for lack of a better term, a non-human type of a question. Yeah, exactly. So that's what these questions do for us. So frame these key issues of external and internal conflict uh, as questions. Will X learn this? Will Y overcome his fear? How can my hero defeat someone who is so much more powerful than she is? What happens if my hero fails? And for me, that's one of the big uh, dramatic questions that people overlook. Always ask the question, what happens if my hero fails? Who gets hurt? Does somebody mm -hmm. die? Is a country overthrown? Does a nuclear bomb go off? Is love lost? Um, you know, Does somebody lose the ranch? Uh, depending on what you're writing. But what happens if there's a failure? Once you understand that, that will heighten the emotion in you as a writer. And if you can convey that then into uh, 
the the storyline, your reader will pick up on that. And they will be asking all of these questions as they go along. That's why you kind of spread it out throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And these are the questions that readers are going to want to see resolved. Um, one of the, you know, criticisms that I hear often is that uh, these questions are brought up, but they are never resolved fully. And so one thing to remember is that if this is your guiding principles, if these are your guiding questions um, from the character perspective and from the overarching novel perspective, you're going to have to tie that up. Okay, so dinosaurs have been cloned, things go wrong, people get eaten. Now what? Um, what happens with Dr. Grant? What happens with Ian? Um, what help it happens with the children? Uh, these are the, you know, John Hammond, these are the pressing issues of the the story that you've brought up as you've brought the reader along. And now the reader is expecting some sort of wrap up. Uh, you don't have to tie everything up in a neat, a neat bow, but you at least have to acknowledge that these things were brought up um, and, and uh, address them in such a way that the reader feels that you have satisfactorily addressed their questions that uh that are there at the end does that make sense yeah it does mm -hmm. yeah. it does and it can become uh, some of these dramatic questions can become extremely important they can become major themes now that's what i did in wounds because my protagonist is a mess um he uh he lost all his courage when uh, uh he was beaten and he saw his uh, uh girl he wanted to date um killed and he knows who killed her, hmm. uh, but he disappeared in any way. It so affects him that he just withdraws. He sits in a dark office at a seminary working. Um, he teaches and that's it. And then whenever he can get away from the seminary, he goes lives on a little boat. Hmm. They call it a yacht, but it's not very big. It's just a tiny little boat. Um, and uh, he lives in that. He, he doesn't. He has a couple of friends from the seminary, but he doesn't hang out. Uh, he's really fractured. Now he gets pulled into this situation where there's a serial killer. He begins to figure out what's going on. He has to deal uh, with a female detective who was the sister of the young lady that was killed so many years before. Mm. And you know, he's never fessed up to having seen that. And now he's working with her. Now, he doesn't want to. He doesn't really get any choice. Oh, boy. She's tough. <laughs> um, so one of the major themes in all of this is can this wreck of a man um, do something well beyond his abilities? Can he face danger uh, when he's a coward? Can he, you know, in this particular case, uh, he works at a seminary. Can he call on his faith to do something more? Can he face his past, which he doesn't want to face? He doesn't want to face people. Uh, can he do all of that uh, and save lives? Or does he retreat and let people die? This was tough. This was really tough on him. It was a it was a tough book to write because of that. But that's a dramatic question that uh, skyrocketed to the top of the book and made the book, I think, uh, one of my better books. I think about um, my character Erica in the Hand of Adonai series, who's you know quickly became one of my favorites. And uh, she there's a there's a dramatic question surrounding her. There's a little bit of a mystery with her and. Um, I bring it up because as we're talking about this and you're talking about your characters and dramatic questions, I think one of the dramatic questions that we need to ask um, of ourselves is what has brought our characters to this point? What has shaped our characters into mm -hmm. who they currently are? Um, so it's not enough to have uh, a, a dinosaur expert. What has happened in this character's history that has pushed them to the point where they've spent their entire lives dedicated to studying an extinct species. Yeah. Um, that That's an interesting question to answer. It doesn't necessarily have to come out in the book, um, but if you know that, then you'll better understand your character. It will shape your character um, and it will likely have an impact on the overall uh, conflict and the overall dramatic question. Um, I do not explain in my the first book of the Hand of Adonai series, I never fully explain what has shaped the character of Erica, uh, but you get to see a lot more of her in the second book and uh, that was one of the i think maybe kind of revelatory aspects of really understanding that character and i think probably one of the reasons why she still resonates with me and she's still kind of near and dear to to my heart if you will so um 
so there's that. Uh, it pops any last minute thoughts or ideas before we move to the chat room for questions? Uh, no, I would say that in the bargain, you did an excellent job with your protagonist dealing with these kinds of questions um, and having to face things he didn't want to face, but that's what made the story. It wasn't just all the things he had to do. Uh, it was what's going on in his his mind, his mm -hmm. heart, with his wife, what, the way the wife was treating him. Mm -hmm. That's what made that uh, a, a great book. It hit on all cylinders, not just the action, not just you know the what if question, but the emotive part um, that we need. But that's it for me. Thank you. I appreciate that. If you need another 10 or 15 minutes to talk about the wonder and brilliance of my writing and my novels, I mean, I'm going to, I'll give that to you. Uh, if we're a little over time because you're <laughs> singing my praises then you know, that's just like, yeah, I see people dropping out of the chat room right yeah, now. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone to you. So uh, Molly, do we have any questions from the chat room tonight? We do. But before we get into that, I want to sing the praises of your great writing. Oh, okay. Because when Pops was talking about the emotions and make, it's not just action driven, I was really thinking about when I read yours and Kay Morrison's Heart Song. Mm -hmm. And that book was just still so incredibly emotional that I'm still scarred. I'm still really mad at you. And I don't ever, 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 ever want to have a relationship if that's what it does to a person. It <laughs> was horrible horrible and beautiful all at the same time. It was very well written. And, and it, for me, I think the majority of for that book was because of it being emotion based, a romance. There were a lot of things in most books that people control their actions, their direction, where they're going and why. And the bulk of this book was these two people that do we get together? Do we not get together? How does this work? How does it flow? And it was so emotion based and emotions are not easily uh controlled so you know so did it, i just it, understand you to say um that his book was horrible and it scarred you is that yes. what you just said yes she had to do I wasn't listening to all of it so you know she I, had to she had to do something to control the the ego that's that's swelling over here what yeah. i meant that in a good way <laughs> Look, Sorry, I, I, can, I didn't I kill myself it. when the book was over or anything like that. Okay. So um, Dave Fessenden would like to know, he says, so question, a lot of characters are tied directly to the plot. What I mean is a dino expert has to be in Jurassic Park. I think it makes sense. Um, I, th mm -hmm. I think Jurassic Park would be very weird if John Hammond did not invite uh, a paleontologist, a, a dinosaur expert. That would just be really bizarre. Now, whether or not you want to make that person the protagonist is entirely up to you. What I think was neat about Jurassic Park is that uh, Dr. Grant was not the central protagonist, or, or rather the solitary protagonist. Uh, he was a central protagonist, uh, but that uh, Ian Malcolm was given almost equal time in terms of... Uh, being able to voice his concerns mm -hmm. and his philosophies, et cetera. Um, and, and as a chaotician doesn't necessarily have much to say about dinosaurs, but he has a lot to say about trying to control things that are not necessarily controllable. Um, so I think th that you have to walk the line of believability. If you've got a, a, um, a spaceship, it makes sense that there's going to be a captain. You don't have to write from the captain's perspective. Um, so I tend to think of the, the space shuttle launch um, where they brought along a teacher. Mm -hmm. And that was so compelling because here's a, a, a elementary school teacher going into space. Um, and that's really fascinating because uh, that's not who you would expect to be up in space. So you can see it in a lot of movies, a lot of books, the, uh, the character in over their head, it's kind of a common trope. Um, but it's still one that that resonates with us because I think at some point we've all felt like we were in over our head in in some regard or another. That makes a lot of sense. I think my perspective is, yes, you definitely want an expert in Jurassic Park also because it doesn't make sense if he's not there to even forewarn whether he's a secondary or a primary character. He's got to be the expert if nobody else is. and it just makes sense to have him there. Otherwise it's sort of, I don't know what I'm, help me out here, Pops. What am I trying to say? It's it's unclear 
he needs to be the one that tells the audience by telling the other characters that I'm the expert and this is why this is a bad idea. So it's yeah. sort of forewarning the audience. Yeah, they're all experts in something. And now remember in the story of, of Jurassic Park, he needs to sign off on it. That's why he's there. Okay. Right. They, they need, there are other paleontologists, but they're all part of the company. So they need somebody outside the company to come and say, yeah, it's safe. There's no, you know, the T-Rex won't be a problem at all. Um, and <laughs> at, first, they wrong? at first he just goes uh, crazy seeing all these things. He's just fascinated. It's the best thing that's ever happened to him. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are walking around. So, you know, he's almost on board. Right. Uh, Ian Malcolm, who's the naysayer through the whole thing, um, isn't on board at all. But then it starts to go wrong. And uh, so the paleontologist is there to save as many people as possible because he understands, he thinks, their habits. Mm -hmm. The dinosaur's yeah. habits, not the people's habits. Okay. Yeah, that confused me for a moment. Yeah, he knows nothing about kids. <laughs> right. Dave also asked, isn't one feature of the monster genre like Jurassic Park that the most arrogant, rotten character is the one who gets eaten at the end? Feels like a pretty consistent trope, yeah. Um, though I would I would argue in Jurassic Park it happens before the end. <laughs> I, I keep thinking about, I think one of the first people to get eaten uh, is the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And people... Yeah. I, was in a, I was in a theater. People applauded the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, it was very was, polite of him. Was, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tough crowd. Bon appetit. Yeah. Well, the guy had been uh, made himself very unlikable. The character, yeah. that is. Um, that is so true. Yeah. So, throwing, so throwing, I'm going to have to watch that again. Throwing sprinkles of salt and pepper at the, uh, the screen. <laughs> trying to season them up. So other questions? Yeah. Uh, no, that is it. Well, Dave wants to know if Aaron's head is big enough to be seen from space. Yeah, it already was. So there you go. Oh, it has its own weather system. Yeah. <laughs> he also wants to know what is the red thing in front of Aaron and why is he wearing his bowling shirt and have these questions been asked earlier? No, they haven't. Aaron. This is my microphone. I have it here centered more because I've noticed that uh, in previous podcasts, my volume was a little bit lower than I was hoping for. My dad has one. It's just conveniently off screen because uh, he's cooler than I am. Uh, this is not my bowling shirt. This is my coaching shirt. I just got back from a coaching meeting, parent uh, coaching meeting for my uh, for the football team. I'll be coaching next year. I'm doing uh, wide receivers, I'm coaching wide receivers. So um, first time I've ever done this. So it's it's real exciting. It's a new adventure for me. Okay. Doki, good for you. Indeed. That is it. Other than Caleb says that um, he tells the room that he remembers that I cried for a week after reading Heart Song. Yeah, I didn't mean to break you with that one. Um. <laughs> I'm easily breakable. I think we've ascertained that in life. But yeah, that one kind. Of, I needed therapy for a while after yeah. that. Fragile I mean is that your in a name. good way. Yeah, yeah, fragile is my middle name. <laughs> I appreciate the five star review that you gave on Amazon that says this book is horrible. It broke me. It ruined me. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. <laughs> that well, is it. <laughs> we are, uh, we're done a little bit early, but uh, that's, that's not bad. I've got a family to get back to, and I'm sure you guys have dinner to eat. So we do thank you all for joining us. If you're trying to find us throughout the oh, week, you can oh, find, oh, wait, 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 wait be Molly. Before you sign off, because you are just so very good at these Im imitations, sign off. Like Jeffrey Goldblum. Like Jeffrey Goldblum? Jeff Blum? Goldblum, whatever. Yeah. Sign off like him. You're on a first name basis with good old Jeffrey. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I could be. It's got to come naturally. Contest? Oh, oh the contest. Yes. Yeah. Let me see. Did you forget that? We, I did. Yes. Thank you. So we had a contest for subscribers to our new newsletter. Second edition was just emailed out yesterday. So in April, if you subscribe to the newsletter and we're active in the chat room during our live cast in April, you are all entered to win one of three prizes. Pops is donating an autographed book of the Harbingers, I believe. Is it the Harbingers? Yes. Yeah, I is just it? need to know whose autograph they want me to put in there. Well, Dave Fezzedin is the one who is winning. So he won that. You're going to have to ask him if he really wants your uh, autograph or maybe just a $10 <laughs> bill. Dave, send me your address. 
And Aaron's donating a $25 Amazon gift card, and that goes to Tess DeGroot. So yay, because we Ooh. like Tess. I've known Tess for years. She's awesome. And I donated a three-month subscription to Audible, and that was won by Andy Clapp. And Andy has left the room early, so I will message him later. Nobody tell him. I'll tell him. All right. Okay. That sounds good. Well, thanks for that, Molly. Thank you all for joining us. I uh, appreciate having you guys along for the journey. In two weeks, we'll be back here continuing our series on gross anatomy of a novel, fresh back from Blue Ridge. And yeah. we're going to take a look at conflict next week. So if you want to find us during the next couple of weeks, you can do that at altongansky.com, at franklymydearmojo.com, or at aarongansky.com. And don't forget, while you're at aarongansky.com, to sign up for our newsletter. So we thank you so much for listening. And until next week, good writing.